Back in the 90s, the PlayStation had a real aesthetic to it. And there are a lot of things that go into creating that aesthetic. And some of that is hardware limitations, the resolution of the console, the way the texture mapping is applied, geometry, lighting. And I'm not going to talk about any of that because today I want to talk about the music. Let me start by saying there's nothing really cohesive about PSX era sound. The styles of the music were pretty varied. The music you would hear in a game like Breath of Fire 3 is way different to the music that you'd hear in a game like Wipeout. And also there weren't really that many hardware limitations that would restrict the music into conforming to a specific format. There wasn't a defined standard. The soundtrack for the game Driver was mod music. It was a bunch of samples that were triggered by a tracker. The soundtrack for FF7 was MIDI music that was played through the PS1 sound chip with a custom sound font. The soundtrack for Rayman was Redbook CD audio. You could throw the Rayman disc into a CD player and it would play MP3s just like a CD. There were a lot of ways to present music on the console and nothing that pigeonholed the music into needing to be a certain way. So what is it that glued it all together? Well, there's one thing about the hardware that could have acted as that glue. The PS1 sound chip had a built-in reverb. It's likely, I think, that a lot of the music you would have heard would have been filtered through that, and that could have been a part of it. But I think when you look across the board at what sort of things went into defining the aesthetic, it's all stylistic. It's the choice of sounds and the inspirations that went into that. PlayStation soundtracks are filled with breakbeats and airy ambient pads. And I could spend a lot of this video tracing back how the stylistic inspirations of PSX music was inspired by Jungle and Downtempo Electronica, artists like Portishead, Wax Doctor and Pascal. But I learned something new recently that a lot of people might already know, but I didn't know. I did know that a lot of the synth sounds that went into these soundtracks could be traced back to specific hardware that the composers used. The Roland, JV, XP and XV synths, for example, have a lot of recognisable sounds. Like if you listen to this track from Parasite Eve, nearly all of the sounds that you're hearing here are default or expansion card sounds from the Roland JV-1080. What this means is that when you're listening to this track, most of what you're listening to are just the default sounds from that piece of hardware. The thing that I didn't know and only really learned recently was that a lot of this music also used samples and those samples were taken from the same cheap sample CDs that regular guys like me were ripping off the front of magazines back in the 90s. And it's obvious when I think about it. I don't know why I didn't think that this was the case, but I just never did think about it. So notoriously, the Silent Hill soundtracks are filled with samples from distorted reality, titanium rhythms, poke in the ear, and zero-g ambient. But those same samples and the same sample CDs show up in games like Spyro the Dragon, Chrono Cross, Crash Bandicoot, they're literally everywhere. So I wanted to look at them, I wanted to dig through some of these sample CDs and I thought that might be interesting and I thought it might be interesting if I build a track out of these samples as I go. That's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to build a track from scratch using hopefully only samples that I find on these sample CDs. The first CD that I look at is Ecstatic Goldmine. Samples from this CD are all over the PlayStation. It's essentially a beat CD. It's filled with drum loops, rhythm and percussion loops, and then a whole lot of like individual hit samples. So as I'm scrolling through listening to the sounds, I mark a couple of things that catch my interest. And then I start digging through a couple of other CDs. I look at the famous one, Distorted Reality, which is probably the most well known of all of these sample CDs. And it's just full of weird stuff. I 
I think if you listen to this, you really can hear how it would have influenced a lot of the PlayStation horror soundtracks. Anyway, I find this sample called breathe.wav. Now this is going to be a little bit weird because I don't have any plan of what I'm doing. I'm just going to grab samples as I find them and figure it out as I go. I'll disclaimer that this isn't an authentic recreation of how PlayStation music would have been made. I'm not interacting with the PlayStation sound chip. I'm using my tools that I have available to me. The only thing I'm doing is using the same samples. So I add breathe.wav to my track. I don't really want to just use samples straight, so I stretch out the tempo and I use some EQ and I could start chopping it up and rearranging it into something different, but for this example, I decided to try something else. I want to use more samples, so I find another sample that I can layer over the top. I take this other one, chicken.wav. And then I layer another break over the top again. Here I can give a real tangible example though. Listen to the sample as I've used it in my track. And then here's the same sample again as used by Stuart Copeland in Spyro 2 Mystic Marsh. Now, one of the things I really associate with PlayStation era music are these airy ambient pads. Listen to the mist theme from Parasite Eve 2. Listen to those ethereal background pads. I'm looking for something like that. There's so many samples to dig through, I don't actually find what I'm looking for. I get distracted and I end up finding something different. I find malaise.wav and I add that to my track. I stretch it out and I stretch it so far that it starts to add artifacting. So I have to sweep through the EQ to find the noise that I want to cut out and then notch it down. Just trying to be not too destructive at this stage. I'm essentially just putting Lego bricks together here to find a shape. This is the basis, these drums, this atmosphere texture, and I build it up from here. I grab another pad, ethereal.wav, layer that over the top, fill up the bass frequencies. Now there's something really discordant with the tuning going on here, and that's the problem with these sample CDs. None of the samples are tuned, really. You can add the pad to your sampler, and you can play a C on your keyboard, but the sound that comes out isn't in C. You've got to tune it first, and you've got to do that by ear. Here's my second disclaimer. I'm not any kind of expert at this. My ears are pretty bad for this kind of stuff, and I'm kind of intimidated by the idea of tuning everything by ear, so I keep putting it off and just focus on putting ideas down first. I just keep adding more and more samples, this gnarly industrial noise. So I pull up my sampler, and I add a kind of mallet sound to it. I run it through a filter. It gives this very ambient, aquatic sound. And it's okay, but I want something else. So I break my rule one time. I add some piano. And I think that's fine. Like I said, PlayStation Music wasn't made using only these samples. They used synths, Rolands, Korgs, pianos. I just kind of improvise a minimal melody, I record it, it sounds okay, I'm not overthinking this. And it's at this point where I feel like I actually have a part of a track, but a part of a track doesn't make a track, it needs some variety. So I spend a lot of time doing some sequencing, adding variations, transitions, creating a part B to go along with it. I find another drum sample, I wanted something that had a ride sound. And finally here I do add some chops on it, manually cutting up the sample and moving it around. There are complex ways to do this, I just like to do it the easy way, which is manually slicing it. Now from your perspective, I've not been working on this for a long time, but from my perspective, where I'm at right now is maybe three or four hours into this process, listening through hundreds of samples, 
arranging, sequencing, recording parts. My ears are getting tired and well, listen to this. My ears have been blasted with this stuff for so long that I can't even really hear that it's not in tune. I've become desensitized to it. Because I didn't fix the tuning at the start, I've just normalized the sound. So it's time for me to take a break. And while I take that break, it's a good time for me to say that a lot of this information was gathered and made available in a spreadsheet, which anyone can look at. And I'm going to put a link to that in the description where you can check it out yourself. Okay, back to the track. It's time to suck it up and get this shit in tune. I do this by opening up my piano, which I know is in tune. And then I give myself a reference point that I'm looking for. And I play that note over and over. And while I'm playing that, I adjust the tuning of the sample using a pitch adjuster until I feel like it's right. It's not a complicated process, but you have to use your ears and you have to trust your ears. And I don't know any other way to do it. So that's how I do it. When it's done, there's one last thing that I need to do. A little bit of mixing. I set the volume of everything on the mixer to zero. No sound. And then one by one, I bring the sounds back in based on whatever I think the order of importance is. And as I'm bringing them back in, I try to find the right level for each of them. And I try to EQ them if I need to. And I try to make everything find a space within the sound where it fits nicely. Do I know how to do this well? No, but I get something. And while it maybe doesn't quite capture the PSX sound that I was looking for, I feel like it's been a cool experiment. For now though, I've spent four, five, maybe hours making a track and I'm gonna call it done. I'm gonna play it out. This is it. The finished product conjured up from the depths of 90s sample CDs. Thanks for watching.